Today I've decided to make not one, not two, but several hundred loaves of bread. This is my first time in the bakery and I've dressed the part. This bakery makes more than 50,000 different products every day and the people who work here know all the tricks and secrets to making the most delicious bread. Hello, Alfia. Hello. Thank you so much for inviting me today. I'm so excited to meet you because I adore bread and you know how to make it properly. I think we'll get along perfectly. Sure we will. Tell me about what we will learn to make today. What can you show me and explain? Well, today we're going to bake white bread. It is one of the most traditional and popular types of bread. A lot of people like it. You mean one long piece of bread? Yes, it is a one long loaf. This bread has been popular for many decades and we're going to prepare sourdough rye bread as well. As in dark brown rye bread? Yes, dark bread, rye bread. Tell me more, I don't understand how to start. Right now I just see a huge pile of flour. Here we go. Rye flour is considered to be one of the healthiest sorts. After all, it contains a large number of minerals, vitamins, and valuable amino acids. When choosing flour, it's recommended to pay attention to its grade. Take all-purpose flour. It's not always the best option because it's made only from endosperm, the center of a whole grain. It consists largely of starch and almost no protein. Clear and low-grade flours are made from whole grains, meaning they contain more fiber and protein. Tell us what we have here and what it's used for. Here we are going to need the dough for white loaves. We've got 200 pounds of wheat flour here. Then, this is 200 pounds of flour? Yes, this is 200 pounds of flour. All the ingredients in the recipe are calculated for every 200 pounds of How many loaves will come from this much flour? Around 250 to 280, well, we'll find it out later. 250 loaves will be more than enough, I think. The recipe for white bread is fairly simple. In addition to flour, you need only sugar, salt, butter, yeast, and water. Well, the secret of success is high quality flour if we use patent flour. The process of baking will really depend on how well we adhere to the recipe. The whole process is going to be automated. Okay, let's add in the other ingredients already. I'm really eager to see the fruits of our labor. The recipe is made up of few but irreplaceable ingredients. Each plays an important role in making the dough. If we leave out even one ingredient, the taste of this all too familiar bread will change dramatically. While everything is mixed together, a series of physical, chemical, and biological processes are taking place. Coming up in the program, why do gluten molecules look like a ball of tangled thread? Can we untangle it by kneading the dough? And what chemical processes occur during fermentation? If you have made the dough, you can make a ball, roll it into flatbread, or give it the shape of a gingerbread man. Dough is very elastic and flexible thanks to the two proteins that flour consists of, glutenin and gliadin. When water is added, their molecules become tangled up, similar to a knotted ball of thread. By the way, we call this compound gluten. When the dough is kneaded, these tangled threads of protein untangle and turn into long chains. These chains then trap other insoluble substances such as starch, cellulose, and fat molecules. As a result, a three-dimensional sponge-like gluten structure is formed. This structure gives dough its elasticity and flexibility. Well then, it's time to untangle the balls of protein molecules and start kneading the dough. So Alfio, all of our ingredients are ready in massive quantities. What do we do next? And please tell me what this machine is and why we need it. This is our dough kneading machine. It is going to knead the dough we've made. Well, Alfia, I'd say we're ready to flip the switch on this massive machine. As I understand it, the dough for dark brown rye bread should be mixed on the lowest speed for 10 minutes, and then we'll check in on it and decide what to do next. That's right, it'll take about 10 minutes. The kneading process takes up to 20 minutes, and then the dough must be allowed to rest, as they say at the bakery. That allows the fermentation process to begin. Alexander, you're up again. My pleasure. 
So, the process of fermentation in the dough occurs to yeast. Yeast is a single-celled organism belonging to the fungus kingdom. Yeast consumes sugar, generates energy, makes byproducts, and reproduces. They reproduce quite rapidly. One cell can divide 20 times, meaning that one cell can produce up to 20 new cells. Yeast generally feeds on sugar, and carbon dioxide gas is a waste product of this process. Carbon dioxide formation can be proven with a simple experiment. All we have to do is put some yeast into a glass of warm water and add sugar. Carbon dioxide is produced, and it can be detected using a lit candle. Now we are going to bring the candle closer to the glass, and as you can see, the flame goes out. This indicates a high concentration of carbon dioxide. While preparing a dough, gluten traps the carbon dioxide and helps the dough to stretch out. As a result, the volume of the dough increases drastically. And once the dough is baked, the gluten and carbon dioxide form a grid structure. Yeast can survive in aerobic or anaerobic conditions. Aerobic means that there is access to oxygen. In such conditions, yeast generates a large amount of energy, emits carbon dioxide, and reproduces. In anaerobic conditions, when access to oxygen is limited, yeast produces much less energy and CO2, but instead produces alcohol. This trait of yeast is fundamental in winemaking. Fermentation of wine is carried out in hermetically sealed anaerobic containers. Thanks to the yeast, our dough has grown by leaps and bounds. It's gotten much bigger. By the way, the volume increases not only due to carbon dioxide, but also due to molecules of oxygen, which get trapped by gluten during kneading. Baking properties of rye flour are significantly different from those of wheat. This is due to different chemical compositions. Therefore, the preparation of rye dough requires a different method. Its recipe, in addition to flour, also includes salt, a little yeast, and red rye malt. What is red rye malt? It is a kind of rye starter, so to speak. We add water into it and get sort of paste. We add really hot boiling water. We scald it for 8 to 12 hours, and then it is added to the dough, and the sourdough bread gets a nice, sweetened malt aroma. The red rye malt plays one of the most important roles in the preparation of the rye dough. It contains lactic acid bacteria, and the process of fermentation takes place thanks to them and not the yeast. Rye flour has a much lower concentration of gluten than wheat flour, and dough made from rye flour is runny because it has high viscosity and plasticity, but low stretchability and elasticity. Leaven containing lactic acid bacteria changes the acidity of the dough. As a result, its physical properties change as well. The proteins contained in the flour swell and the dough becomes the necessary texture and rises. It is due to the lactic acid fermentation that rye bread gets its sour taste. And because lactic acid retains moisture and acts as a natural preservative, rye bread has a longer shelf life compared to wheat bread. Well, I can't smell alcohol now, so you must have done something right. Yes, this time the fermentation process didn't lead to the formation of alcohol, and I'm already making the gluten mixture. Developing a gluten structure? Well, yeah, I'm stretching the gluten molecules, if that's clear for you. The proteins contained in flour turn into gluten, and then water is added. Exactly. And now we need to knead the dough to make it elastic and stretchable. Could you give me a hand? Yes, sure. Here you go. Tell me, how long should I do this? There's one way to tell if the dough is ready, by rolling it into a ball. Let me show you. To test if the dough is ready, you make it into a ball and then drop it onto the table. If it holds its shape, then it's ready. Wonderful. Did the bakers teach you that? Of course they did. 
By the way, the blue baker's hat suits you very well. It's actually a hat, Alexander. Well, Alfia, as they say, man can't live on bread alone, so I'd like to learn how to make croissants as well, not just loaves of bread. And I've always thought that layered pastries are hard to make, but it turns out it's a cold process as well. Why is the temperature so low in here? Do you want to freeze me? No, we don't want to freeze you, but we need to be in cold conditions to make puff pastry. You can't work with it in warm conditions, and we really get good croissants only when we sustain the right temperatures. When preparing bread dough, we try to speed up the fermentation process, but we try to achieve a different result when making a layered pastry. The yeast should be slowed down as much as possible. That is why we work in lower temperatures. The dough should only rise when it's being baked. What is the temperature in here? The temperature in this workshop is about 65 degrees. Well, I'd call it quite chilly. It is chilly, but we need to sacrifice something for a good quality puff pastry. Let's get down to business. What is the difference between layered pastries and regular dough? What's the secret and how do we bake it? There are many recipes for cooking puff pastry, of course. Our recipe has many ingredients. We add sugar, butter, we add only high quality butter into our puff pastry. Nothing but the good stuff. All or nothing, but to be frank, our croissants are very high quality. You see, we make the pastries quite thick. I mean, you might have noticed we use a softer dough for bread. Croissants must be light and airy. To achieve this, all the rules must be strictly observed, and one of the most curious steps is rolling out the dough. Alfia, this is not just a machine, but a miracle. Let's turn it on, and then you can tell me about all of its secrets. Well, this is a dough rolling machine. We roll out the dough with its help. I mean, the dough is rolled out in one direction, then the shafts of the machine are lowered from time to time so as to roll out the dough again. Well, the thickness must be around half an inch. You can do the same with a rolling pin here. The process is just automated. The same results can be reached with a rolling pin, but here, of course, it's automated. Yes, it's automated. You can use a rolling pin for smaller qualities. Coming up in the program, how many layers are in a croissant? Why need the dough twice? And what is the secret behind making Italian ciabatta and focaccia bread? The technique of rolling out dough is not complicated, but does require skill. First, the dough must be rolled out into a rectangle and butter is then spread on it. After that, the dough is folded like an envelope and rolled out again. Butter is used to keep the layers separate and prevent them from sticking to one another. The final product can have anywhere from 50 to 200 layers. The butter which is placed between the layers of dough must be spread at the same thickness from edge to edge. Otherwise, the butter will not spread evenly during the rolling process, and as a result, some of the finished product will turn out to be too greasy, and elsewhere, too flaky. And that, in my humble opinion, is how a perfect croissant should look. Today, we aspire to achieve the same result. Alfia will help me with that. Alfia, tell me the secret to getting that perfect form. What do we need to do to get it just right, and how exactly? We have rolled out the dough at a certain thickness. We have folded our layers in half and cut them into triangles. Alfia, you're in charge. What do I do next? Okay, take one triangle. Any one of them? Yes. Yes, we have two croissants in it. Divide it into two. Divide it in two? You see it's easy to separate them. The dough is cold. Yes. Then you hold the triangle by its corners. Okay stretching them out a little and start rolling. Hold these corners slightly and do this simultaneously. I mean, roll the ends and pull the quarters. Okay. And then roll the croissant in an absolutely natural way, pressing only lightly. Look! Here we get a croissant. You can also make the ends a little longer or you can make them slightly shorter. So Alfia, do you think I'll get paid for my work? We'll see. Look, it's identical to what you did. Now that the dough for the pastries is ready, it's time to give it its shape. But before that can be done, the dough must be kneaded once more. At the bakery, it's done by hand.
White flour dough, which contains fewer proteins and therefore very little gluten, is called weak. You can only knead it once, since it's easy to break the chains of gluten. If that happens, the dough won't be elastic and stretchable enough to hold the carbon dioxide emitted by the yeast during baking. But dough made from so-called strong flour is much thicker. It can be kneaded again two or more times so the gluten becomes more elastic. The same principle applies to a stick of chewing gum. The more mechanical impact it undergoes, the more it softens. Finally, the shapeless dough has become similar to the familiar white loaf and dark brown bread. However, during the re-kneading and molding, the dough volume decreased. It happened because of the loss of carbon dioxide. To enrich the formed dough with carbon dioxide again, we put it into the proofing oven. It supports the conditions under which the yeast starts to work as actively as possible. By the way, our croissants are stored here as well. They also have to be enriched with carbon dioxide after they have acquired the necessary shape. In the proofing oven, a certain temperature and humidity conditions are supported. If we take bread as an example, then the temperatures must be 95 to 100 degrees and the humidity is about 75 to 80 percent. The proofing oven allows the dough to take the form we are using or to seeing on our table. The wheat dough can increase in volume in two or in two and a half times. We're coming to the finish line. Our loaves are going straight into the oven. It's the final stage for all the chemical and physical changes in the dough. The activity of the yeast is accelerated in the first few minutes of baking. This ensures a sharp increase in the dough's volume. The starch on the surface of the dough crystallizes. This fills the pores of the finished product, smooths out irregularities, and gives luster and gloss to the crust. When the temperature inside the loaves reaches 30 degrees, the lactic acid bacteria die. This causes the loaves to stop increasing in size. Thanks for the explanation, Alexander. Finally, we have the finished product, and it looks quite appetizing. There's something nice about knowing that I had a hand in preparing these croissants. So how to find the croissant that I made with my own hands among hundreds of them? It's very simple. Here it is, the most beautiful one. But sadly, I can't eat it here, so I'll just take it with me. I've just about mastered making loaves of bread and French croissants, but I don't know the first thing about Italian bread, so it looks like it's time to learn the secrets of making focaccia and ciabatta. So here we are in an Italian restaurant. We'll start with the preparation of ciabatta, which translates to slipper, probably due to the bread's shape, although they could have come up with something a bit more appetizing. Hello, Anton. Hi. How are you? I'm great. Thank you for inviting me to your restaurant, because if I'm being honest, I love bread. And today, if I'm not mistaken, you're going to treat me to not any typical white bread, but Italian ciabatta. Yes, today I'll teach you how to do it, and how to do it correctly. And we can get started right now, because I have all the ingredients ready. The recipe for ciabatta is, in fact, very simple. Salt, leaven, yeast, flour, and water. But the proportions of everything is very important. The dough should be runny, giving Italian bread its unique shape. Well then, ready, set, knead? Yes, you can turn it on. How? There's a switch on the other side. Slowly? Yeah. Great. And is the speed important? Right now I put it on a two. Yes, it is important. Actually, you can increase it. Speed it up? Sure, so now the dough should be kneaded for about five minutes. Oh, really? Yes. So we actually have time for tea? Of course. After mixing, the dough should not be kneaded. You want to keep the maximum amount of carbon dioxide bubbles as possible, as they are what forms the large cavities in the bread. But ciabatta, just like white bread, must be allowed to rise due to the presence of yeast. So the dough is placed in the proofing oven. While we wait, Anton and I will begin to tackle the preparation of another type of Italian bread. Well, I'm excited to continue our lesson on Italian breads. What's next? Have you prepared something else for me? Now we will learn how to make a focaccia. 
We are going to have a slightly unique style of focaccia because we are going to add cuttlefish ink to it. Focaccia is already something out of the ordinary to many non-Italians. What exactly is it? A type of flatbread? A sort of pizza? Well, we can basically call it the base for a pizza. I mean, the shape is the same, but without anything on top. The dough for focaccia, unlike ciabatta, should be very dense. And that's why it's important to get rid of any carbon dioxide bubbles using a rolling pin. Tell the truth, do you like it when others are doing all the hard physical work? Yes, of course. Must it be rolled that long? Well, not necessarily. We should check how thin we've rolled it out. It should be... How thick should it be? It should be an eighth of an inch, about. Well, the thinner... I think it may be thinner than that already. It's a piece of art. The dough is placed in the oven with the help of a special spatula, which allows us to keep its shape easily. Then it is baked at a temperature of almost 600 degrees, but for a very short period of time, just a few minutes. Ciabatta, on the other hand, should be baked for about half an hour, and it's ready. It's time for my favorite part of the episode, tasting. I can't wait any longer. Let's taste what we've made with these talented hands. All right. Seriously, this is delicious. And of course, you'll never mistake white bread or a baguette even for ciabatta. It has such a unique flavor. Now let's try the focaccia. I think you'll be able to taste the ink. I don't think I taste it. Really? I don't know. Really, it's absolutely delicious, amazing. I'm happy and ready to eat it and take what's left with me, but I don't taste ink, honestly. I'm just telling you the truth. Well, that's okay. Do you think you can live with that? Of course. Well, what do you have there for me? What, you think I've made all these pastries and breads for you? To be honest, yes, I am counting on it because I'm very hungry. You know, just after I went to the master class at the bakery and at the restaurant, I realized that making bread is a real science. You win. So I trust only professionals with the preparation of croissants, cakes, and white bread. So you're just giving up? But you already had the dough ready. I mean, I had some problems with the oven, so I went to a grocery store to buy a white loaf of bread, some rye bread, and buns, and most importantly, some sausage. So you can make a sandwich and enjoy yourself. Uh, thanks. But maybe you want to tweak your method of working with yeast to make dough? Maybe someday you'll put your baker's hat back on. For now, why don't you tell me how gluten is formed? <laughs> 